secret and that a woman must keep her virginity as a special gift to give her husband. In order, in order to avoid the spectacle of thousands of sexually frustrated and tense lesbians roaming the streets bereft of husbands, Mr Abbott will no doubt logically be forced to also support my push for gay marriage in his vision for Australia. It's logical. Now, I think the romantics among us would celebrate marriage as we've heard it described as a stable bond, sorry about the horse reference again, a stable bond between two people who work to create a loving household and a social and economic partnership. Well, you know, that might sound a bit sort of home corn fieldy type, but I actually think that a marriage requiring two people to think about something apart from their own needs is pretty much a good thing, you know, like I think it's a good goal. I think it's something that we should all aspire to. I think marriage is a good thing. But you don't have to believe me. We've heard a lot about the religious right tonight. I would like to quote from the words of American Republican Conservative Mr. Theodore B. Olson. I don't know why they always have to put the initial in there, the religious conservatives. But he, I'm quoting an article, he, he probably many of you have read it, from Newsweek just um, recently, the 9th of January this year, and he put the conservative case for gay marriage. Now, don't look dismayed, there is one. He stated, the very idea of marriage is basic to the recognition of equals in our society. Any status short of that is inferior, unjust, and unconstitutional. I know it's fairly disturbing having the conservative Republicans arguing our favour, but you know, hey, it's a debate and it's a point and I'm raising it. Conserv conservative arguments against gay marriage are often hinged on it being some of the things you've heard tonight about it's against the tradition of marriage. Hello, that is so naive. Marriage the way we view it at the moment is a, a union of equal partners. That is really radical if you look at the history of marriage. It didn't just evolve a minute or two ago, as my, my fellow um, debaters on the uh, other side would be, have you believe. Ma marriage has been around since Abraham's day, and as you know, monogamy didn't become the norm in the Christian world until the 6th century. I'll make a few other points as we move through history. The mid-19th century it took until the courts started to recognise that women may be victims of domestic violence. Husbands regularly enjoying mistresses, my friend said also concubines, prostitutes, that didn't even get a frown or a twitch until the 20th of the century. By the 1970s, most US states had finally gotten rid of head and master laws that said a husband has the right to decide where a family will live and whether a wife can have a job. And don't forget that in Australia about in the 60s, if a woman got married, she had to resign from a public service job. Simply because something has always been done a certain way is not a reason for it to stay that way and it's a bloody good reason to change, to bring things into this century. What about when religion is used to support the oh my god, don't let gays marry or the world will collapse argument? I'd just like to tell you, Mr Leviticus, well I'm assuming it was Mr Leviticus, I'm not that religious but I'm guessing, Mr Leviticus twice refers to sex between men as an abomination. He then goes on and on and on about treatments for leprosy, cleanliness rituals for menstruating women, the correct way to sacrifice a goat, a lamb or a turtle dove. Really, how can people regard Leviticus's advice on the evils of homosexuality with any more seriousness than we give to his far lengthier and more detailed advice on the best price to pay for a slave? Now, I can't comment about other religions, but the Christian Bible has been overwritten, rewritten, contextualised till you're blue in the face. Basically, a mature view of spiritual authority requires that we... Uh, sorry, a mature view of spiritual authority requires us, as has been done by all Christian churches in the past, to move beyond literalism. But what about the argument that gay marriage is somehow going to devalue heterosexual marriage, this is my favourite one, how fragile can this institution be at the moment? More than 50% of marriage three years. Brittany got married for 42 hours. 
Jordan got married to a cross-dressing cage fighter in Los Angeles. Uh, by the way, apparently not for the publicity. And that was her third husband. And I don't want to even start on Tiger Woods. <laughs> I'm just reminding myself why it is we wanted to get married again. Sorry. <laughs> My... <laughs> note ladies and gentlemen and other people who identify with either of those characteristics um, my friends my gay and lesbian friends um, worry about their relationships when they have children they get very scared that their little girl or boy is going to be faced with prejudice and bullying when they go to school having gay marriage accepted by the community would send a message to the world including kids in playgrounds and having two mums and two dads is not unusual. Now, I can't end my debate tonight without appealing to economic rationalists in the audience. I know, it's sad, isn't it? Gay marriage is good for the economy. It is. You've heard, you've heard some of the references tonight. Just imagine the David Jones registry list to start with. You've got gowns, you've got suits, you've got appliances, you've got linen, you've got Prada, you've got Dolce & Gabbana, you've got Louis Vuitton, Kev, you've missed a great opportunity. This is the, this is the economic stimulus package that we have been looking for in Australia.